campaign season, abortion rights are now front and center, following Tuesday's surprise vote in Kansas, where more than 60 percent of primary voters signaled they want to maintain abortion rights in that ruby red state. How might this turn of events change Democrat strategy in the coming weeks? Do they lean into this issue and hope for a voting surge? And could that, plus a possible climate and tax deal in the Senate, give President Joe Biden and the White House a political boost? Meanwhile, Republicans still feel the wind at their back, at least when they look at most polls. But they're facing lingering questions about who they are and whom voters should see as their leader. Earlier today, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, opened its latest gathering, this time in Dallas, Texas. The CONFAB is a reminder of the dynamics inside the GOP. While congressional Republican leaders are eager to focus on inflation and the president, many activists are far more hardline. The political movement of nationalism, here and abroad, continues to gain traction, fueled by anger toward global institutions and established political leaders. In Dallas, CPAC, Texas will today welcome Viktor Orban, the hardline nationalist prime minister of Hungary. He spoke earlier today. Then former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon will speak on Friday. And finally, former President Donald Trump on Saturday. Joining us to open their notebooks and discuss what's next are two top reporters, Scott McFarlane and Trevor Honeycutt. Scott is a CBS News congressional correspondent, and Trevor is a White House correspondent for Reuters. Good to have you both here. Scott, let's begin with the politics of the economy. Democrats remain hopeful they can pass this climate and spending bill in the coming weeks. But as your reporting shows, it's not a done deal. Give us a behind the scenes glimpse, Scott, into where that whole discussion and negotiation stands. Yeah, Bob, I spent a chunk of the day with Joe Manchin, who is usually the pivotal player when everything's hanging in the balance. But of course, he cut the deal last week with Senator Schumer to get this ball rolling down the hill. And now they're waiting on Senator Sinema of Arizona, who has been expert at avoiding reporters over the past few days, and she continues that winning streak tonight. Senator Manchin says they're going to, in his words, land this plane. He says, I can't tell you exactly when, but it's going to land. They're starting the clock. They're starting the procedure over the weekend, which means they're losing their weekend, which sets the table for possible final passage early next week. But it's still that holdout senator, Senator Sinema, and whatever issues she's pushing back on. The latest reporting we have is it's over one of the tax provisions, and there are multiple provisions in this bill, one involving investment funds. It's part of the revenue generation that will be used to pay for the new programs and pay down the national debt a bit. Getting Senator Sinema on board may require some type of give, some type of yielding. We'll see how that plays out over the weekend, but it appears they have all but one of the votes they need, and Senator Manchin is expressing optimism they'll get the last one. Trevor, maybe it takes a little bit of give in the negotiation. Maybe it takes a call from President Biden. Uh, traditional way deals are, are closed on Capitol Hill. What is the White House doing right now to push this, to finalize this deal? Uh, can the president do anything besides use the bully pulpit at this point? Well, you know, the White House has been cognizant that when they've gotten involved in congressional negotiations in the past, and including with Manchin and Cinema, that it hasn't been um, always that effective. Um, that it always it hasn't always been effective for them to be publicly involved, um, and that they uh, you know they feel like their best role is is kind of in a support role, letting the negotiations play out, and then if there's a a problem or a place where they feel like Biden can weigh in publicly and help, then he will. But most of what they're doing is on the staff level, and it's in it's in the background and and intentionally so. Um, and then um, and then you could see Biden get involved personally in these negotiations, um, but even that. Would would be they would try to keep a, a tight lid on that and make sure that that was a a one-on-one -on -one call with with uh, with uh, Senator Sinema or Senator Schumer um, so that they can strategize um, privately and and not and not have that become a public issue. Trevor, when you're talking on background with people close to the White House, close to the president, what's their real view of Senator Sinema here? Do they believe she wants to get to yes or she wants to get to no? Sure. Yeah. So the the White House is actually 
cautiously optimistic about Senator Sinema. Um, they they think that that there's a lot in here that she can sell to to her constituents. Um, uh, even though she doesn't have a race immediately, she has obviously you know pressures back in Arizona, um, and uh, so there is a sense that there's a lot in this bill that is is frankly designed by her and, and something that, that she supports um, in terms of the climate provisions, in terms of prescription drug care, that are all going to be really beneficial um, uh, for her in, in an electoral sense. And so they think that that, that is kind of the, the, the motivation that will get her on board, even though she doesn't like some of the, the tax provisions. Scott, the fallout from the Capitol attack, which, of course, you've been closely covering, it continues to hover over this election season as well. And FBI Director Chris Wray, he testified before the Senate earlier to today. What more from the FBI or the Justice Department could bring that story back into the spotlight politically? He was asked, Director Ray was, right at the beginning of that Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, Bob, about the outstanding arrests, the ones that haven't been made yet. The Justice Department has said, in so many words, there will be more arrests. In fact, they estimate three to 400 more arrests, in addition to the 850 or so already been made. Director Ray was asked, why has it taken so long? Why are we now 19 months later, we're still trying to find 350 people? And the director said, partly because some of the people in the mob that day were distinctively, uniquely good at masking their identities and almost came to the Capitol, perhaps with that motivation. But also, and this is what was most striking, Bob, he said there are the bigger conspiracy cases that take more time to investigate, to produce. Scott. I want to dig into that real quick with you. The conspiracy side of this, that investigation, do you expect the DOJ to move on this before the election on the conspiracy front if they believe someone from the Trump White House was implicated in the Capitol attack in some way, or do they wait until after the midterm elections? And there is a policy that has been reinforced over recent months through reporting that the Justice Department treads lightly in election years on any issue or any case that has a nexus with politics or elected officials. Let's put that aside. There's a different complication, Bob, between now and Election Day. The biggest conspiracy cases so far, the accused seditious conspirators, the Oath Keepers, they go on trial this fall. Their trial dates range from September to November, the very weeks before the midterm elections. It's possible the Justice Department holds off on charging new seditious conspiracy defendants, no matter what their position or rank, until those trials are over, so as not to interfere with or complicate the trials. The Justice Department wants to get those trials done. They don't want them delayed any longer. So that might be a factor I think not enough people are talking about. It's so interesting. We're watching to see if former President Trump gets in early into 2024. Where does Merrick Garland, the attorney general, go with possibly moving uh, on the former president in terms of prosecution or not? We're watching Georgia. We're watching New York. But, Trevor, there's also foreign policy. We have John Kirby from the White House coming up in a little bit. You've been tracking the Biden White House and foreign policy in recent weeks. When they look at Ukraine and Taiwan, do they see these issues as playing into the midterm conversation in any way? You know, potentially. I mean, we've we've got an escalation um, in in uh, obviously around Taiwan, um, and you know, there the memories are long uh, at this White House. They remember that that the issue that kind of. Uh, set off the big downward spiral in President uh, Joe Biden's approval ratings was the Afghanistan withdrawal and mishandling a foreign policy crisis can can cause deeper concerns among voters about the the fitness of the commander in chief and so that's always in the back of their minds when they have a, a flashpoint um, like this. Um, you know, now Taiwan has been a a pretty bipartisan issue as has um, the the response to uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, um, but you know we have an election coming up and. So there's there's always there's uh, in the back of you know certainly the White House's mind is a sense of okay well when does that uh, consensus collapse and and can we count on um, you know a a House um, controlled by Republicans to give the, uh, the same level of financial support uh, to um, our, our efforts in Ukraine um, and can we count on on uh, the, the same level of, of support for our strategy um, for China or will it become a political issue um, so it, it hasn't yet but there's a, a, a concern that it might might become an issue in the final few minutes here I want to start with Trevor then Scott I would love for, to have you jump in to come back to the point from the beginning Kansas Tuesday such a 
interesting moment politically now that abortion rights are clearly going to be part of the midterm conversation in a bigger way. Trevor, inside the White House, a few days later, how is this changing their framing, their thinking of the coming election campaign? Well, they they always knew that um, much as they wanted to talk about the accomplishments of this administration, that um, that the conversation was going to be steered back to things that are um, not accomplishments of this administration. In particular, the uh, uh, inflation uh, spiral and and the the loss of the um, the Roe v. Wade abortion rights um, in this country, and that those are going to be two 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 tr tricky issues for them. I think there's some optimism now coming out of Kansas that that's an issue that um, that they. Can win on, um, that, and that they want to put Vice President Harris out in front of as a public figure um, and, and as a galvanizing force to get people to come to the polls. Um, and um, you know, and and inflation continues to be a tricky topic for them. But the, you'll continue to hear them talking about gas prices, especially if they're coming down right into election day. And Vice President Kamala Harris was in Boston today doing just that, talking about abortion rights. Scott, wrap us up here. What about on Capitol Hill? How does Kansas change their calculation? I talked to sources in the House side and the Senate side. The Senate side is particularly interesting right now, Bob. Mark Kelly, one of those frontline incumbents up for re-election, has a new ad out just today, hitting his new Republican opponent on abortion issues. I'm told that the DSCC, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, has circled all these states saying abortion rights are an issue. But look at New Hampshire in particular. That's the one where, again, they have a frontline incumbent. But where abortion rights pull so well, where abortion rights are so protected and have been for so long, they really think, at least the outside sources think, the DSCC can really mobilize there in that New Hampshire race. Scott McFarland and Trevor Honeycutt, appreciate your, your reporting and your time. Thank you. And in the wake of Tuesday's primaries, a number of campaigns are retooling their messaging, as Scott said, going into the midterms. Veteran Democratic consultant James Carville joins us on what he thinks the Democratic Party needs to be showcasing to get voters out to the polls. Plus, just after a jury tells Alex Jones he must pay millions to the families of those killed in the Sandy Hook school massacre, the House Select Committee now wants his phone records. We'll get into why you're streaming Red and Blue. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming gender. I did not realize that you could change your gender. Realizing how you feel. You can be a boy, sometimes you feel like a girl, sometimes you feel like both. Redefining who you are. Identify as trans. Gender fluid. Non-binary and queer. Is the idea of gender a thing of the past? And to be yourself, always, no matter what anyone says, I love you. Are the kids all right? Gender, now streaming on the free CBS News. App. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. Want to go someplace new? Yeah, you do. See something new. Learn something new. Meet someone new. Nate B in the house. There's always something new under the sun. CBS Mornings, weekdays. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared.
people from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me! We, got it. we share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. I've been waiting patiently for something like this. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream on the free CBS News app Tuesday mornings. For months, Republicans have been confident that they could retake control of the House and Senate this November. But after Kansas voters rejected a ballot measure that would have opened the door to abortion restrictions, some Democrats now believe they might have found an issue that will make them more competitive in the midterm elections. Joining us now is veteran Democratic strategist, a friend, James Carville. James, thanks for being here. Well, Rob, it's good to be here. You do a great job covering American politics. Glad to be part of the show. Only wish I could be there with you in New Orleans. James, what's the consequence of Kansas? Well, it, 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 in some ways, it's a political earthquake. I mean, it's said of Mike Tyson that he hits you so hard he changes the way you taste. I mean, <laughs> American politics tastes different today. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I was campaigning in Kansas a week before the, the, the ballot proposition, and you could feel there was a lot of energy, and they, they ran a very smart messaging. They talked about Kansans for constitutional freedom. And they were very careful to make it about freedom and, and interference and, you know, how these right-wing preachers and these Catholic bishops uh, tried to rig the whole deal in their favor. And people resented it. And I was, I got to tell you, the turnout was enormous and the margin was, was, was huge. But I, I hope the Democrats take from this to lesson that, you know, we need constitutional protections and talk talk about that. We need to expand rights. And I, I think that's more effective messaging than just, you know, talk, talking about it in, in, in other terms. They were very smart uh, the way they went about this. James, I, I keep thinking about your famous phrase from 1992, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, that's what so many Republicans keep saying these days. How do Democrats make it about more than the economy in the final 90 or so days? Well, I, I think we need to talk about what the president is doing or trying to do to negate some of the effects of inflation. Uh, you know, can can really talk about gas prices. I mean, everybody wants to pivot. I, I don't think you can pivot away from the concerns people have. But, you know, uh, Robert, you've been doing this long enough. And, you know, even like Ron Brownstein, people are, there's decoupling out there because it, the, the Republicans should be doing a lot better if you get direction of the country and presidential approval, which are two pretty reliable indicators of off year elections. As of now, that they're they're acting weirdly. They're not they're not lining up the way they're supposed to. I, I don't know. It's a, a some Republicans say, well, you just when it gets close to election day, it will. I have no idea if they're right or not. But this is this situation is uh, what's the word sui generis. We just never seen anything like this before in American politics. And I, I I'd, I'd be lying if I said I had great confidence in which way it turn out. But. If you told me as a Democrat that we would be in, on June the 4th, that we'd be where we are today on August the 4th, I would have been pretty pleased. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> on the economy, is the inflation issue, especially with gas prices, baked in? Or if gas prices continue to drop, will the Democrats be able to run on some of that? Well, it, it can't hurt. I mean, uh, it, I mean it, they're still historically high. But they have come down, and I, I mean, the hope is is that they'll continue to come down. But uh, you know, you know, I'm not very good at predicting gas prices. But it, and you know, if there are other things, and in, in, it what Kansas showed, and you know what we see in uh, you know in a Nebraska special election, uh, the electorate is not behaving it, it, as you would expect it to do with, with some of the stuff. And you know, the other thing is there's still a lot of jobs being created. I mean. The, it, it's not it's not like there's no economy out there. I mean, Biden's probably created more jobs in his first 18 months as president than anybody else. And so it's, it's not all doom and gloom. 
What about uh, President Biden? What's your assessment politically of where he stands inside his own party? You've heard the comments from Congresswoman Maloney and others that he might not run. Uh, what's, uh, what's your take on what all that chatter means? You know, I'll think about any of that after this election, but I'm kind of like this. said, a statesman looks to the next generation of politicians in the next election. I look to the next tracking poll. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, my my my, my concerns are me. But he, if he just if he runs a re-election right now, then he's got a, a you know, he accomplished a lot. I don't know how much credit he gets for it, but the the and let's see if they can bring this land this airplane on on this Senator Mansion Senator Schumer deal. Uh, and if they do, it'll be, it, it'll be pretty remarkable. But it, it, it's tough to land the plane sometimes. <laughs> do you believe uh, President Biden should run again in 2024? I think he's he's earned the right to be the Democratic nominee if that's what he chooses to do. Uh, I think he's he's done a good job as president, and he'll you, you know as he approaches that he'll he'll make his decisions. But should he should he do it? I know you know I, again I, I, you check with me after the lecture. I'm not into giving President Biden. I think he has a remarkable record. And I'll talk about you know if he, if he he has a record a successful record to run on. Uh, and uh, ask me after the election. Vice President Harris was in Boston today talking about abortion rights. Uh, how do you see her role in the midterm season? Uh, I don't think people are going to, you know, she, she can obviously uh, can rally parts of the Democratic base, uh, uh, you know, but I don't think I've never seen a midterm where a vice president was really a, a consequential figure in, in that midterm. But, uh, then it's good that she was, you know, she's rallying people, and I'm sure she's raising a lot of money for the party, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of campaigns that, that will bring her in. Uh, but I, I, I don't, I, I'm stretching my mind to think of maybe Cheney had some influence in, in, in electorally, but that generally uh, elections decide on something else other than the vice president. So Kansas now is a big variable, changed the whole way people think about this midterm election. What about if former President Trump jumps in early into the 2024 race? What would that mean for the midterms? I, I, I kind of hope he does. I, I mean, I think the more that he's out there, the, the, the kind of better it is for us, because he, he's popular with a certain part, maybe it's a majority, of the Republican Party, but not much more than that. And I, I, I think if he makes to, makes it about him, that that's fine with me. I, 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 don't, I, I would encourage him to get out there early. I, I don't have any political fear of him, and and I don't have very much political fear of the people that, that he got nominated in, in like Arizona and places like that. I, 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 th I think the best thing to do is smoke these people out and beat them at the polls. That, that's the best way to curb uh, Trumpism. You know, I have a lot of my friends are, you know, criticizing the Democrats for running these spots, promoting these Trumpist candidates. I, I'm totally comfortable with that. I, I, I think that's really a smart thing to do. And, and you know, and what, the about way the, to, what about the risk to democracy, James, if you're promoting a candidate who's election denier and they win? Well, you know, sometimes you got to trust democracy. And, and the, they voted for these people. The Democrats did not vote for, for, for this clown in, in Michigan. Uh, they didn't vote for these clowns in Arizona. Uh, the Republican primary voters put them in there. And I, I, as opposed to being afraid of that, I think the best way to save democracy is to actually win at the ballot box, not to act like the threat, you know, to expose these people, bring them out in the open, and then open fire on them, you know, open political fire, I mean, obviously. Uh, it, it, so I, I, I don't, and they're trying to win an election. That's what you're supposed to do. When I ran campaigns, I had one goal in mind. But there are no to, guarantees to in politics, James. Someone, someone could easily slip through the cracks and win an election, and then hold up things if they're an election denier it, once they're in office. You know, it's Republicans that voted for these people. It wasn't Democrats. And but Democrats, Democrats are, are spending some money on it. What they think is in, what they think is in their best interest. And we're going to win that election in Michigan, all right? That, 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 and actually, sometimes you do this stuff and it doesn't work. That that the and it, it look you run a risk that it backfires. But when you're in a a, a a cycle like this, a tough cycle, you do anything that you can 
to illegal to try to give yourself an advantage. And I, 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 I'm not upset. Not only I'm not upset about this, I would do the exact same thing if I was in the DCCC's position. Uh, you've been a longtime friend of the Clinton family. Should Secretary Clinton, former President Clinton, be called on by Democrats uh, to be out there on the campaign trail in this final stretch? Uh, I'm sure she's talking to, uh, uh, you know, his campaigns and things. But, uh, you, you know, the party, one of the things that the Democrats have to do is, you know, we, we got to embrace the younger generation. I, I was out in Kansas campaigning against the Noah Amendment for a guy 31 years old, Patrick Schmidt. You know, we, we need to get we need to really get behind some sort of fresh people. And I consider myself an old fogey. I'll, I'll be 78 this October. But, you know, I, I, I think we got to. You know, we got to show people that we're part of the future, and that, that's a, a critical thing all, all across. A final thing here, James. I, I think I can see you're wearing an LSU uh, sweatshirt. Is that right? <laughs> that's correct. Yes, sir. Oh, L Absolutely. LSU uh, took—I'm a Notre Dame guy. Uh, you took our former coach, Brian Kelly. Do you have confidence that Brian Kelly is going to revive your football program? One hundred percent. And you know what's interesting, Robert? The Notre Dame people said, that's terrible. LSU came, you know, and something big money in college football, post our coach. Well, Notre Dame posted him from Cincinnati after he went 12-0. and 0. I didn't see anybody in Notre Dame say, oh, poor Cincinnati. And, I mean, college football is, is, is a rough and tumble game. This guy is the winningest coach in the history of Notre Dame. And I've been very, very impressed with what I've seen down here. And there's been a lot of talk, well, he's never been in the South. You know two coaches that never coached a game in the South till they came down South? Nick Saban and Urban Meyer. And I think they got like eight national championships. Well, James, so, uh, we'll see. I, he, I may have to come down for that LSU-Alabama game and see if your prophecy pans out down there uh, this season. But, James Carville, thanks so much for being here. We you. appreciate it. You uh, would be welcome anytime. I'll take you to the game. I know people. I can get good tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that. A Texas jury has ordered noted conspiracy theorist Alex Jones to pay $4.1 million to parents whose children were killed in the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre. It's the latest verdict in a series of legal problems for him. Earlier today, the January 6th committee in the House requested phone records from Alex Jones. Jones, as you remember, is a vocal supporter of former President Donald Trump, who has denied the legality of the 2020 election. And yesterday, in a Texas courtroom, a prosecutor revealed the attorney for the InfoWars host accidentally shared with him years of Jones's texts and emails. Quite a development. Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have the same book text messages on your phone? And you said no, correct? You said that under oath. I mean, if I was mistaken, I was mistaken, but you, you got the messages right there. You know what perjury is, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is? Yes, I do. I mean, I, I'm not a tech guy. I told you I gave, in my testimony, the phone to the lawyers before or whatever, and, and so you got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. Tomorrow, the InfoWars host faces another trial, which will determine punitive damages for lying about the Sandy Hook shooting. A Russian court has sentenced WNBA star Brittany Griner to nearly a decade in a Russian penal colony. The sentencing comes just days after Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. had extended an offer to bring her back home. John Kirby, the National Security Council's coordinator for strategic communication, joins us next on China and the military's provocations around Taiwan. Plus, a pro-Putin authoritarian leader, a twice-convicted former Trump advisor, and a Republican congresswoman stripped of her committee assignments. Those are just a handful of the speakers for the annual conservative gathering known as CPAC, this time in Texas. We'll talk to someone who is covering it there live next. You're streaming CBS News. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? 
A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming gender. I did not realize that you could change your gender. Realizing how you feel. You can be a boy, sometimes you feel like a girl, sometimes you feel like both. Redefining who you are. Identify as trans. Gender fluid. Non-binary and queer. Is the idea of gender a thing of the past? And to be yourself, always, no matter what anyone says, I love you. Are the kids all right? Gender, now streaming on the free CBS News app. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. Want to go someplace new? Yeah, you do. See something new. Learn something new. Meet someone new. Nate B in the house. There's always something new under the sun. CBS Mornings, weekdays. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging winds. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me? We, got it. we share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. I've been waiting patiently for something like this. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream on the free CBS News app Tuesday mornings. Welcome back to Red and Blue. I'm Robert Costa. Here's a look at some of our top stories. We have new information about the tragic car accident where Congresswoman Jackie Walorski and two of her staffers were killed yesterday in Indiana. Authorities say the SUV driven by Walorski's staffer, Zachary Potts, veered into oncoming traffic for unknown reasons. The sheriff's office initially said the other car caused the crash. The Justice Department is charging four current and former Louisville police officers following the death of Breonna Taylor. The 26-year-old black medical worker was shot and killed by police officers in her apartment during a botched raid in 2020. Taylor's death sparked protests across the country about police brutality and systemic racism. And a Russian court has found WNBA star Brittany Griner guilty on drug possession charges. The judge has ordered her to serve nine years in prison. Griner pled guilty to drug charges last month, but said she did not intentionally break Russian law. Tina Krause has more from London. From behind bars in the back of the Russian courtroom, Brittany Griner listened as a translator passed along the verdict. The judge found the 31-year-old basketball star guilty of deliberately bringing vape cartridges containing cannabis oil with her when she flew to Moscow in February. Griner was sentenced to nine years in prison. Very upset, very stressed, and she's, well... She can hardly talk. Before the verdict, Greiner offered an apology to the court. I made an honest mistake, and I hope that in your ruling, 
that it doesn't end my life here. Griner's lawyers had argued the Phoenix Mercury Center and two-time Olympic gold medalist inadvertently packed the cannabis canisters. They presented character witnesses from the Russian team she plays for in the WNBA offseason and written testimony from a doctor who prescribed her cannabis for pain treatment. Medical marijuana is legal in Arizona. I never meant to hurt anybody. I never meant to put in jeopardy the Russian population. I never meant to break any laws here. The verdict comes as U.S. and Russian officials are negotiating a prisoner swap. Last week, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke to his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, urging him to exchange Griner and former Marine Paul Whelan for Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, known as the Merchant of Death. We had a frank and direct conversation. I pressed the Kremlin to accept the substantial proposal that we put forth on the release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner. Russia offered a counter-proposal, asking for the release of a Russian assassin held by another country. The White House is calling it a, quote, bad faith attempt to avoid the U.S. deal that's on the table. Tina Krause, CBS News, London. For more, John Kirby joins us now. He is the NSC coordinator for strategic communications at the White House. John, thanks for being here. President Biden has condemned the sentencing of Brittany Griner. How would you define the state of negotiations between Russia and the United States? Well, we're still in negotiations. I want to be careful not to get out in public in, in terms of the details of it, uh, but we're still uh, trying to, to make uh, a deal here to be able to get uh, Brittany and Paul home. We have proposed an offer to the Russians. In fact, uh, Bob, we did that weeks ago, uh, and we're waiting for them uh, to accept what we believe is a, is a, is a very serious proposal here uh, to bring Paul and Brittany home. So the conversations are continuing, uh, but we're going to be a little careful about uh, detailing uh, too much of it uh, in public right now. But this is a turn, John, and Secretary Blinken, as you mentioned, proposed a deal for the release of Ms. Greiner and Paul Whelan. Is that deal still on the table, or will it need to change in the coming days in order to secure their release? Yeah, again, I don't want to get ahead of negotiations. I will tell you the proposal is still on the table, uh, and we urge the Russians to accept that, that proposal, the one that we put forward uh, weeks ago. Is the United States position different in any way in terms of who it's prepared to offer in exchange in terms of maybe a Russian arms dealer like Victor Bout or anyone else? I don't want to get into the, the, the actual details uh, of the proposal that we made. Uh, all I can tell you is it's a serious one uh, and we urge the Russians to accept it. But I think it's probably a better right now where we are in the stage of things uh, if we don't get too much of the details out there. Uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic if you were talking to the Griner family tonight? What I would tell the Griner family tonight uh, is, number one, uh, the president is laser focused uh, on, on Britney's release as well as Mr. Whalen's. Uh, it's something that he gets frequently updated about uh, and that we are going to continue to work hard until we get them both home with their families where they belong. Now, I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, we don't know what uh, it's going to take, actually, uh, to, to make that happen. Uh, but they need to know, all the whole all American people need to know, uh, that we're really focused on this very, very hard. We're working on it, uh, and uh, we want to see them home just as fast as possible. John, you're not only a spokesperson for this administration, you've spent a career in uniform serving this country in the military. You've closely followed what's happening in the South China Sea. How alarmed are you about what's happening right now with China's live fire drills? Yeah, it's concerning. Uh, we knew, and we said Monday, we knew that they were going to conduct exercises, protect, potentially missile launches, fly across the median line in the Taiwan Strait. So a lot of the things, Bob, that we've seen them do over the last uh, 24 hours, we expected them to do. That doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make it less worrisome. And the real risk right now is one of miscalculation. They're doing exercises. They're doing drills. Again, just like they, we, we said they would and they announced that they would do. But when you have that much hardware in the air and at sea, close together in confined circumstances with all these tensions, it, it could lead to decisions that are, are miscalculations and mistakes that could actually up the tensions even more. We don't want to see a crisis erupt out of here. We've been very clear about that. We want peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And we urge the Chinese uh, to stop these provocative actions. There's simply no pretext or no justification, I should say, uh, for upping the ante and increasing the tensions uh, any higher than they already are right now. 
So then how will the United States respond to try to show China it can't be this aggressive at this time, while at the same time trying not to escalate the situation? That's, that's a very good question, and, uh, and, and we are working hard uh, in private channels. Channels of communication are still open with the Chinese to, to communicate all the same things we're saying publicly. The speaker's trip was not inconsistent with the One China policy. There was no violation of Chinese sovereignty by her visit, contrary to what they said publicly, and we're going to continue to support Taiwan as we do under the Taiwan Relations Act. So we're making it clear, and we're being very consistent in, in what we say publicly and privately with the Chinese. Chinese. Secondly, and I said this earlier today from the briefing room, uh, we're going to keep uh, the Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group on, on nearby uh, to monitor the situation. We are going to continue to fly, sail, and operate in accordance with international law. That includes in the Taiwan Strait, and I think you'll see that in coming weeks. And we're talking with allies and partners, including Japan, of course Japan, uh, about how we can make sure uh, that together uh, we can all meet our treaty security uh, commitments to one another uh, and, to, and, again, to, to better security in, in the region. So it's not just about words. It's not just about communications. That's happening. Uh, but we're also uh, we're making it very clear, actually, indeed, how seriously we take our security commitments there. John, you say you're making it clear. Indeed, you also mentioned that there are efforts, private and public. Is anything being done? I know you can't perhaps get into details, but is anything being done by Secretary Austin or Chairman Milley to privately calm the waters with the Chinese through those personal relationships they might have abroad? I would tell you, Bob, that we have multiple levels of communication uh, that are open to us with the, the Chinese, and we're using all of them. And I think I better just leave it at that. Well, it's a bit of a, a nod toward that. John Kirby, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. The Conservative Political Action Conference, known as CPAC, kicked off in Dallas, Texas today. And as it usually does, the gathering is drawing Republican leaders and key conservatives from across the country. But what makes this CPAC different? is how it is also drawing conservatives from across the Atlantic Ocean, where right-wing politics and nationalism are certainly on the rise in several nations, including in Hungary. And the Hungarian prime minister, Viktor Orban, who has been politically close with former President Donald Trump, spoke this afternoon. Orban has recently drawn sharp criticism, even from some of his allies, for saying he opposes having a, quote, mixed race future for his nation. Other scheduled speakers at CPAC Texas include Trump himself on Saturday and former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon, an avowed nationalist on Friday night. Bannon has worked with leaders of far-right movements in, in Europe and elsewhere. For more on all of this, we're joined now by Dave Weigel, the Washington Post national political correspondent who was at the convention. Dave, great to have you here. You usually look at things through a national political prism, but what is the geopolitical and national implication to having Orban at CPAC? Well, it was laid out in the prime minister's speech to CPAC. I had a lot of Americanisms, a lot of movie quotes. But his, the point of his speech was that conservatives need to, uh, in his words, uh, play by their own rules to defeat the left. So they need to be ready to dismantle the institutions of the left, they need to be ready to be called names. They need to be ready to just do what is necessary. And if they do that, they're going to win. And so what you see in Orban, you've been seeing this on the American right for a number of years, uh, is, is a model of governance uh, that, they, that there's a wide belief Donald Trump should copy or Ron DeSantis should copy if he takes back power. Uh, don't worry about offending the media. Don't worry about offending institutions. And use the power of the state, as you're kind of seeing in Florida and some other places, to shut down institutions that are not serving uh, the needs that, that you were elected to, to, to fill. Dave, you've covered the Republican Party for years. We've covered CPACs together, going back to the Tea Party moment inside the GOP, uh, where CPAC has been a mainstay. How has CPAC changed since those Tea Party days and the earlier days of CPAC back in the 70s and 80s when Ronald Reagan was the main draw? There's less of a debate at CPAC. When I started coming in the, in the two, late 2000s and at the end of the Bush era, uh, there was an argument about what, what conservatives should be doing. Should they, the libertarian wing of, of the movement, had, had debates with the more nationalist wings. And frankly, in 2007, 2008, the first conventions I went to, 
Uh, the sort of Tom Tancredo nationalist, uh, let's let's build a border wall conservatives were pretty marginalized. The, 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 the leaders of the conference, leaders of the Republican Party thought those sort of politics would never lead you to a majority. Uh, that has changed. This is a, a very Trump-colored CPAC uh, under Match Lab's leadership. The media that is here, uh, the sponsors of the conference, they've changed. They're all much more pro-Trump. Uh, uh, MAGA outlets and work outside the mainstream media, work outside even the Republican Party itself. You notice you talked about some people who are uh, who are, are going to come. But you'll notice Mitch McConnell's not here. Kevin McCarthy's not here. Um, Jim Jordan is here. So the the forces inside the Republican establishment that are angling for Trump to get back or were out, going out of their way to try to overturn the 2020 election, they're really in the driver's seat of the conference. And the the conservatives who disagree with that are not are just not here. As you've just outlined, this is really seen as a gathering of Trump supporters, Trump voters. But where, Dave, does the former president actually fit at CPAC in 2022? Is this a crowd in Texas that wants him to run desperately, or do they see him as one of many options for 2024? They see him as one of a few options. There's a lot of enthusiasm for Ron DeSantis. There's, it, it, we're in Texas. There's less enthusiasm for Greg Abbott or for Ted Cruz, and I'd say for either of those two men. Uh, but it, it is less about the, the, the men, except for the, the people who believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. It is more, we need fighters like Trump who are going to go in there and not be afraid to dismantle the left and, and make, you know, make targets out of the media. Uh, that attitude, and that attitude was, was always there with conservatives, but that, that is the mindset. I haven't heard, and there hasn't been much of a focus on, on 2024 talk. I'd say it's generally assumed that Trump should Trump is going to run and be their nominee, and if he doesn't, then someone like DeSantis is the front runner. Uh, people are not wearing their gear, or their shirts, as they have in the past. To the extent anyone's wearing anything that that shows their support for a candidate, it's all Trump. Dave Weigel, good luck in Texas. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. You're streaming Red and Blue on CBS News. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming gender. I did not realize that you could change your gender. Realizing how you feel. You can be a boy, sometimes you feel like a girl, sometimes you feel like both. Redefining who you are. Identify as trans. Gender fluid. Non-binary and queer. Is the idea of gender a thing of the past? And to be yourself, always, no matter what anyone says, I love you. Are the kids all right? Gender, now streaming on the free CBS News. News app. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. Want to go someplace new? Yeah, you do. See something new. Learn something new. Meet someone new. Nate B in the house. There's always something new under the sun. CBS Mornings, weekdays. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. 
CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me! We We share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. I've been waiting patiently for something like this. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream on the free CBS News app Tuesday mornings. We are so excited. We just can't hide it. Drew Barrymore. Hi, guys. Mayor Sorvino. Ms. Lopez and Mr. Maluma are Reggie. It's the Fonz. Wow. The I know. It's yeah. all right. One question. How often do you consume cannabis? <laughs> CBS mornings are, well, everything your morning should be. Is this a date or are we just friends? <laughs> Here we are, your favorite morning people. CBS mornings, starting at 7. President Biden signed an executive order Wednesday directing Health and Human Services to provide support to women traveling out of state for abortions. It comes after Kansas voters chose to keep their constitutional right to an abortion, making the state an outlier among its neighbors. Lana Zak takes a closer look at the hurdles women seeking abortions are facing. Hello, Robert. At least 16 states have already banned abortions or will in the coming weeks. Some of these bans are already in effect, like in Arkansas. Other states, like the ban in Texas, will begin soon after surviving a series of court challenges. Women in states with active bans face financial and logistical hurdles to get the procedure. For example, a woman living in Little Rock, Arkansas, seeking abortion services. The nearest place that she could travel is Wichita, Kansas, six and a half hours away. These state abortion bans stop in-person services, but for some women, abortion pills are still an option. This method is becoming more common. Over half of all first trimester abortions performed in 2020 were by abortion pills. And the cost for those can range somewhere between $250 on the low end and $600 on the high end. But women still face legal hurdles to getting pills by the mail. 19 states require a doctor to be physically present when the medication is administered, which also has the potential to increase costs. Texas and Indiana outright banned any telemedicine abortions. And to go back to our Little Rock example, uh, first trimester abortion at a Kansas clinic costs a minimum of $750 out of pocket, which, of course, doesn't include the cost for travel, time off of work, or any hotel fare. Robert? Lana Zach, thank you. We're going to take a quick break, which means you have a couple of minutes to download the free CBS News app on all your devices. You can catch live local coverage from across the country from all of our CBS stations. And while you're at it, check out Paramount Plus. We've got a mountain of content for you to stream there as well, including your favorite shows, movies, and sports. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming gender. I did not realize that you could change your gender. Realizing how you feel. You can be a boy, sometimes you feel like a girl, sometimes you feel like both. Redefining who you are. Identify as trans. Gender fluid. Non-binary and queer. Is the idea of gender a thing of the past? And to be yourself always, no matter what anyone says, I love you. Are the kids all right? Gender, now streaming on the free CBS News. App. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. 
Want to go someplace new? Yeah, you do. See something new. Learn something new. Meet someone new. Nate B in the house. There's always something new under the sun. CBS Mornings, weekdays. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail. We're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me? We, got it. we share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. I've been waiting patiently for something like this. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream on the free CBS News app Tuesday mornings. The Senate has overwhelmingly voted in favor of adding Sweden and Finland to NATO. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell called the nation's addition a, quote, slam dunk for national security. Republican Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri was the sole senator to vote against their inclusion on Wednesday. Republican Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky voted present. All 30 member countries must approve Finland and Sweden's inclusion for final ratification. So far, 23 nations have done so. That does it for today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And a reminder, if you want to watch previous episodes of this program, you can see them anytime on the CBS News website. Just head to cbsnews.com slash red and blue. CBS News Sunday Morning with Jane Pauley on CBS. You ready? A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What if I was white? A lot of people like to call names and make you feel ashamed for being proud of who you are. Now streaming the internet. Technology is baked into the DNA of our generation. Social media, apps and games. I like my iPad, my phone, my Nintendo. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, it's one click away. Is growing up digital a blessing or a curse? There is so much pressure to be perfect. We need to have conversations regarding healthier usage. Are the kids all right? The internet, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather is about to get extreme. We're talking about hail, we're talking about tornadoes, damaging wind. Every second counts. Let's now take a look at what that really means to you. That's why CBS News and the Weather Channel have come together to bring you virtual weather technology. So advanced, so real. We can show you what it's going to look like when the storms come through. You'll see what will happen, where it will happen, before it does. Feel the forecast on CBS News. Time to get prepared. I'm Nora O'Donnell in our nation's capital. We're here at the White House with the President of the United States. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We've never done an interview like this before. That's correct. Tonight, a congressional investigation sparked by reporting from CBS News. What's your message to consumers? They need help now. Tell him I feel it. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell from Washington, D.C. on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. We will witness yet another moment in history. We have an inspiring story that started with a strange act of kindness. Yeah. We found it. You're kidding me? We, got it. we share stories that lift you up and brighten your day. The Uplift. Stream on the free CBS News app. 
You know him as a comedian, but he's using his celebrity as a force for change. People think veterans get health care for life. They don't. We go person to person with Jon Stewart. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan Vigliotti. Thanks for joining us. Here's a look at the top stories we're following right now. Monkeypox has officially been declared a public health emergency. How the decision will free up more resources as cases rise and vaccines are hard to come by. Plus, federal charges in the death of Breonna Taylor. What four current and former Louisville police officers are now facing. WNBA star Brittany Griner is sentenced to nine years in a Russian prison for drug possession. We'll go to the White House to see where negotiations stand over a possible prisoner swap. And later this hour, a debate is underway on Capitol Hill over the climate and tax bill known as the Inflation Reduction Act. One week after Senators Manchin and Schumer came to an agreement, one of their own Democratic colleagues is now hitting the brakes. Plus, China near Taiwan, days after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited the island. I'll speak with an expert on East Asia politics about the threat from Beijing. But first, the Biden administration is declaring a public health emergency for the monkeypox outbreak here in the U.S. More than 7,000 cases have been confirmed across the nation. That's more infections from the virus than any other country in the world. Nikki Batiste has the latest from New York City. The Biden administration says today's declaration will take its response to monkeypox to the next level, freeing up funding to increase testing and treatment. The move comes after weeks of criticism for its sluggish response to the growing outbreak. Is this move too little too late? I think it should have been done earlier, but at least it's being done now. It is at a point where we can control it. 